Thanks, Gregory. Welcome to all of you and to uh, insomniacs throughout the United States. Uh, I have a, I, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jeff Frank. Um, Jeff Frank uh, is a, an accomplished writer. Um, those of you who uh, buy the book today uh, will be blessed in reading the, the prose. Jeff spent uh, 13 years at the Washington Post. I'm not sure that's where you learn how to write well, but that's certainly where you learn how to get a good story. And by the end, he was running the Outlook section. And then he went to the New Yorker and was a senior editor there for nearly 13 years. And that is a place where you learn to write well and help others write well. Besides writing nonfiction, uh, Jeff has written three, four, I guess, four um, works of fiction. So this is someone who understands the importance of narrative and of a good story. And he brought those talents, for some reason, to the relationship between Eisenhower and Nixon. And I want to begin by asking you, Jeff, no. why, why did you choose that particular marriage it, to it was, be the focus of this Because war? it really was a great story. Here's, here, it, it began with two people who really didn't know each other. One of them was, the, was an American hero of the sort we don't have anymore, a five-star general. There are no more five-star generals. The man who was given credit for leading the Allies to victory in Europe, 62 years old, and a 39-year-old Orange County congressman uh, who were ran together. Eisenhower ran with Nixon, but he didn't even really choose him as vice president. He, he wasn't even aware that a presidential candidate gets to choose his vice president. And so he later was asked by James Reston of the New York Times, how, what really happened the night when Nixon was chosen? And Eisenhower said, well, you know, there, I had my advisors and there were six or seven people on the list and Nixon was on the list. And so they got together and they, they, they had a very strained relationship that went on and on uh, during Eisenhower's presidency. It became closer when in the post, -pre which Nixon, what Nixon calls his wilderness years and Eisenhower's post-presidency. And then around 1966, Eisenhower's grandson, David, who was going to Amherst, began to date Julie Nixon, who was going to Smith seven miles away, and they completely were crazy about each other. A year later, uh, that was, they were 19 years old, a year later when they were 20, uh, they, were, uh, uh, they were married. And, uh, and, so the, and they became one family in, the, in, in November of 1968. They had Thanksgiving together, the Nixons and the Eisenhowers, and Julie's, uh, Julie Nixon's firstborn was an Eisenhower. And I thought that was just a great story from beginning to end. That's what, that's what drew me to it. Now, the topic of tonight's discussion is rethinking Nixon. It is. Did this experience of writing about this relationship cause you to rethink Nixon? I thought about Nixon a lot. I saw Nixon, uh, I'm not sure that I ever really, I'm not sure that I really rethought him because I wasn't doing the Nixon presidency. I was doing, even though I do have an epilogue which deals with what, what came after, what came after. But I really only deal in the book with three months or two months of the Nixon presidency, which began when he was inaugurated and two, two months later Eisenhower was dead. And, that's, and, that, and that sort of covers the story. From, from their first meeting, they met at the Bohemian Grove, that exclusive men's club in out north of San Francisco. And, and it ended up with, uh, with uh, Ike's death in, in 1969. What, a, what kind of, what sense of the man did you get? Of, of Nixon, Nixon, you mean? Yeah. He baffled me, and I found him extremely complicated. I was just, I was just sort of riveted by, his, by, 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 by the sort of different sides of him. I, I was, he could be really vindictive and, 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 and sort of vicious, even, 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 even long before all the tapes that we've all heard. He would refer to, at one time he referred to his... 1960 running mate Henry Cabot Lodge as a, you know, a knuckle-headed, gutless wonder and that sort of thing. And yet, he could be so kind to people I, uh, and so generous in, in ways he didn't have to be. He always had a thing about the Kennedys, but when he was president, um, he, he invited Mrs. Kennedy and her two children to come see him in the White House. And it wasn't just a perfunctory, oh, look around. He spent time with them. They played with the dog. And they wrote him, they all wrote him thank you letters. And then he wrote personal personal thank you letters handwritten back to all to, to the two children that was so touched Mrs. Kennedy that she wrote back to Nixon and said, well, it was such a sweet thing. So he had that side of him, on, uh, and then he had this other side, and he just he completely baffled me. What really struck me in reading your book is, is the, how mean uh, Dwight Eisenhower was to Richard Nixon. Yeah, I, what, what <laughs> interesting. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, it's amazingly it's amazing how mean. I mean, you, can, you should give some examples of... Well, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it, Eisenhower wasn't even aware of it. I think Eisenhower regarded almost everyone who worked for him as staff. 
And, and here, Nixon was a lieutenant uh, commander in the Navy, and there again, Eisenhower was, uh, was a five-star general. I mean, to try to, I try to get a sense of that today. We don't, as I say, we don't have any. We have four stars, and like, like, uh, like, like David Petraeus. But it's the, it's the difference sort of between, between sort of uh, leading the Allied Expeditionary Force in the invasion of Normandy or running the surge in Iraq. It's just a, there was a cold different in magnitude of what these, what these men were. And, and Eisenhower, again, Eisenhower was so big, both parties wanted him to run. Jimmy Roosevelt, FDR's son, wanted him to run as a Democrat. There was even some talk of, well, he could run with both parties and then they would have different vice presidents with, with them. I mean, they, they, yeah. they, they, he, was, he was beloved. And, so, and so, I, so, in, so in a sense, Eisenhower was almost oblivious in some ways to, 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 what, to, to his effect on people. And yet, I think there was, there was a, in some cases, some deliberate cruelty. And I think and it, it started off in a very bad way. I'm, I'm sure you all know the story of the, the, uh, the fund crisis. Which, 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 which began with this, with this um, a story in the New York Post saying that Nixon was supported by, by a group of millionaires, a secret group of millionaires, and, and there was a lot of pressure to get Nixon off the ticket. And Eisenhower, in fact, wanted him off the ticket. And, you know, I, and the long story short, Nixon went on television, explained himself, so to speak, re revealed all of his finances, talked about a dog named Checkers that he wasn't going to give back, and defied Eisenhower's order to resign. Um, he said, uh, write to the Republican National Committee, basically circumventing Eisenhower's right to remove him from the ticket, and he won. And, but from that moment on, things were never, in some way, things were never the same, even though, even though they did become closer and they worked together. Um, Eisenhower, um, Eisen, what Eisenhower did to him, Nixon later wrote, was a scar that never healed. And Julie, Julie Nixon, in, in her book about her mother, said that every September 23rd, which was the anniversary of the Checkers speech, her father would say, you know what day this is? This is, this is, this is the anniversary of that speech, and he never forgot. Okay. So, and there were, there were many, I mean, many, many episodes of cruelty. He tried to get him off the ticket in 56. Nixon fought back. He would do things, he would, he would do things like, he, not even really sort of caring. When Nixon was finally getting a vacation in the summer, in the summer of 58, he was off with his family and, it, and all of them, they were off in West Virginia. I saw up of the phone Dick, I want you to come back to Washington and fire Sherman Adams. I mean, there was just, it was never, there was never any, any, any rest from him. He was, he was not, he was not a really kind boss, and he really, he wanted his own way. But I say, I don't, some of it was just sort of casual, sort of casual indifference to the feelings of other people. Um, we're seeing, I mean, tonight, those, for some reason, all of you decided not to watch the State of the Union. Um, <laughs> But somebody in the country, some, some people are watching the State of the Union, and, and, and we're watching now, of course, a, a, um, a dialogue between a, um, a resurgent re-elected president and a divided Republican Party. Um, you wrote about a quite a different Republican Party. It was a different party. Um, the, uh, <laughs> the, there were sort of, there were, there were outliers, well, of course, the party was totally different. It was in, 19, in when Nixon, when Nixon was, and Eisenhower was there. It was the Civil Rights Party. It really was the party of Lincoln, the, and the, the Democrats were Jackie the Robinson. Jackie Dick Robinson was, supported Nixon. So did and, and so did uh, and Martin Luther King was a sort of was a big Nixon supporter until 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 they had a a, a, a bad moment in 1960, 1960 when Nixon when Nixon didn't come to, didn't come to his to his aid. No, and and Nixon and the Eisenhower administration and Nixon with Nixon. Working, the, working in the Senate, sort of lobbied for a stronger version of the 1957 Civil Rights Bill, which was considered a landmark bill at the time. And, and uh, so they were, they were very different parties. And the, and the two wings of the Republican Party, there, were, there, was, a liberal, there was a liberal wing and a, and a conservative wing, so to speak, but the, liberal, but the conservative wing were people like Robert Taft, um, who, who he was an isolationist, but he supported uh, old, age, old age pensions. He was he had a real social, social conscience and so on. There were there were outliers. There was a man named Ezra Jenner who thought that an invisible UN government had taken over the country, and there was Senator McCarthy. But they were outliers. They weren't they weren't they weren't they didn't speak for the party. And uh, and in fact, Eisen, though Eisenhower was very reluctant to ever take anybody on directly, he he thought he really did want to get get get, get McCarthy sort of excised from the from the party, and he and he put Nixon up to it. One of, the, one of the challenges for someone writing about Richard Nixon, I think, I'd like to know if you share this view, is that we have an ocean of information about him as president, largely because he decided to leave it. <laughs> for himself, he didn't expect the public to have access to it. And we don't have as much about him as vice president. And, yeah. we, and, and how, how easy or hard was it for you to get to the inner Nixon when you wrote about him in the 50s? Well, it's interesting. I mean, t I, mean th I'll th I give a lot of credit to, to, to Timothy, who was the director of the Nixon, the Nixon Library. A lot of stuff was open. 
And you could go down there and, and you could go through this, you could go through, go in the archives and find, and, and the more time you spend,